There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Ertman. I am the president of Rotary Club of Portland, and it is a pleasure to actually see all these faces here today. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. So here are my three quick tips that I want to give to everybody so you can optimize your experience at this meeting today. Our goal is to make this online meeting as close as we can to the experience that you get to have at the Sentinel when we're actually all there in person. You will actually get to have a small little breakout room later on, um, about 10 minutes or so, and you'll get to experience what that, that is like. You'll be able to speak with just a couple of other members, so that'll be delightful, I'm sure. But before we do that, of course, we have our announcements. So uh, the three things that I would like to put out to you about Zoom, in case you are not familiar, is first off, you have noticed probably that when you joined today, when you immediately joined, your microphone was on mute. Please keep it that way or put yourself back on that way if you could please. So um, the camera basically doesn't shift back and forth whenever it hears different noises from different rooms that people are in. And right before our main speaker, I will explain how you can unmute to then be able to ask questions of our speaker. Secondly, at the bottom of your screen, you will see where it says chat. You can click on there and a chat window will pop up on the side. And at the bottom of that window is where you can type a message if you need to communicate in some way, whether you're having some technical difficulties, though hopefully you're not having so much technical difficulties that you can't click on the chat, but well, we'll figure all that out. But you can also just say hi to everybody there. That would be great. Use, use the chat room, please. And third, you have a choice of how you like to view this meeting. I don't know if everybody knows this, but up in the top right corner of this Zoom screen, you'll see it will either say speaker view or gallery view. You can try it out right now. You can keep clicking on it during the meeting if you'd like, but that way you can choose which way you like to view the meeting. You can go from gallery view where you're gonna see a ton of faces and arrows to go on moving through to see more faces of fellow members that we have all missed or you can just hit on the speaker view. You'll see small video of everybody in the meeting except for the person who is speaking at the moment and that will be the big window. Great, so just try it out right now. See which way you prefer it best. Go for it. And now I would like to welcome Rotarian Dan Bramski to give this week's reflection. Thank you, President Kate. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. The month of June is Pride Month around the world and commemorates the Stonewall Riots, which occurred at the end of June 1969 in Greenwich Village in New York. On the night of June 28th, white and black and brown gay men, lesbians, drag queens, and trans women led the fight against the brutality towards the gay community. Today, I want to take a moment to recognize this history by sharing a few quotes by Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, born in 1912, was an openly gay black American leader involved in social movements for civil rights, socialism, nonviolence, and gay rights. He collaborated with Martin Luther King Jr. and many other leaders, but due to the fact that he was openly gay, he was often only involved behind the scenes in organizing and leading these causes. Rustin died in 1987 and was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama in 2013. And today I'll share three quotes of his. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him. Let us be enraged about injustice, but let us not be destroyed by it. And the final one. The real radical is the person who has a vision of equality and is willing to do those things that will bring reality closer to that vision. I'd like to ask each and every one of us to ponder these and consider what they mean to us as Rotarians, as members of our families, communities, and our nation. Just as the summer of 1969 was a historic movement in the pride movement, excuse me, a historic moment in the pride movement, we find ourselves in another historic moment, the summer of 2020, and the opportunity to make our world a better place for all through our actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Yes, round of applause. Thank you, Dan, so much for 
being um, willing to give the reflection today as well as tying it in so well to what many of us are experiencing, what we're all experiencing and what's going on right now in our country and our world. So thank you very much. I actually don't want to move on before I say that um, if anybody wants to give a reflection at future meetings, please just contact Siobhan or Corinne to find out when we have openings for you to be able to do exactly what Dan had done with um, whatever you would like to reflect on that day. So contact the office for that and get on that schedule. Now I'd like to welcome any guests. I do not have the skills and ways of attention to be able to see if there's anybody on here who is not a Rotarian. I did see Abby Collins name though. Oh, Tom's wife. I see her waving. We've got pages of people here. So I'm not going to get to probably not going to see everybody. I see Dick Thomas down there. Fantastic. I love seeing former Rotarians of our club come on back. But welcome to all of you today. Thank you for jumping on in and experiencing our first of what hopefully won't be too many live on on, a, on our computers, we clean meetings. Hopefully we'll be able to get together again soon. But for now and for the foreseeable future, this is how we'll be doing it. So welcome to everybody that is a virtual guest today. Also, it is still the month of June and I would like to extend a happy anniversary to everyone who became a Rotarian in this month of June. You can see the list right here, right here. You can see the list of everybody that had joined the club in the month of June for the past many, many years, going back many, many years. And you can also always look at that list in, um, on our website under the membership. Um, we've been suggesting, and I will suggest onward and onward, that that is a great way if you're thinking, I'd like to reach out to somebody at Rotary because I haven't seen and talked with anybody in Rotary in a while, and um, I just want to check in with somebody. That is a great prompt, that list, the anniversary list each month, because that's a great way to start the conversation, to just say, hey, happy anniversary. Did you know you've been in the club X number of years? And they may or may not know, but you can start a conversation that way. Works out really well. And plus, you might uh, actually make a new connection within Rotary with someone you might not usually sit with on Tuesdays. Okay, here we go. This is our big activity for today. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that we're going to strive to replicate some of the things we have um, that we can do in an online video meeting with what we get to do when we actually get to be with each other in person. So what we're gonna do now is have, you might call it a virtual table talk. And in a few moments, all of us here, we will disappear. And we will be reappearing in a room with two or three other Rotarians. It is completely randomized. And we will um, have about eight minutes to just chat, to catch up. For some folks, it might be actually introducing each other. So please do make sure that you all introduce each other, even if a couple of you already know each other really well. But make sure that there is um, introductions and then do what you normally would do if someone sat down at your table. Just chat. I have a prompt question if you want it. It's not necessarily. I'm not going to quiz you on it. But um, a prompt question would be, what have you missed most about Rotary these past three and a half or so months? So I will... Uh, uh, oh, you'll get a warning, warning, but you'll get a visual cue on your screen that will say there's about a minute left before everybody will just magically reappear back into this group. So onward, let's do this. I think Corinne might be the one who's going to push us all into these magical rooms. Let's see what happens. Magic. Oh, it's gonna happen. Oh, people are moving. It's starting to happen. Join breakout room. I Scott and Charlie, do you have invitations to join breakout rooms? Right. 
Scott, can you hear me?
it worked. It worked. I think it worked. It worked for us. Fantastic. How lovely. It's good to see all of you back. Perfect. Well, if anybody has any um, comments, thoughts about that experience, you can type it in the chat or, of course, let us know offline and, and um, reach out to me or to Siobhan or Corinne or anybody on the leadership team to let us know if, um, yeah, just any ideas you might have of how to do that differently or if you liked it, whatever. Whatever. Now is uh, the time when you all really came here today, I know, uh, to, to uh, hear from our next speaker, someone that you all know pretty darn well. That is, of course, Scott Burns. But before I pass the mic to him, I would uh, like to let you know how we are going to do question and answer or how we're going to try to do question and answer here today. We're going to try to use the technology in front of you again. And you will see on the bottom of your screen, there is a button that says participants. And if you click on that button, which you can do right now or do later on, if you click on that button, it'll bring up your name into a column. Your name will be at the top of the list of everybody here. And you can click on the hand icon that's there. And that is essentially you raising your hand. So what I'm hoping is, and I'll make this reminder at the end of Scott speaking, but what I'm hoping is that in an orderly fashion that um, I will be able to see the order of some, some idea of an order of folks raising their hand digitally. And then I can call on each person afterwards to ask a question if you have a question afterwards. I will go over that again when we're back. So right now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Most of you know him, but you probably don't know what he knows about Antarctica. Please welcome fellow Rotarian and past president of our club, Scott Burns. Okay, thank you, Kate. And what we are going to do is, let's see, I need to share that. So Kate, can people, everybody see that? I'm seeing if can, anybody can raise their thumbs up if they can see it or well, it, it, chat if you don't. Sounds good. So uh, good afternoon to everybody and uh, Big day in the world of geology, 7.4 earthquake this morning down in Oaxaca, down in Southern Mexico. And uh, so when I get off of this, I'll do a little interview with Channel 6 about that. No, uh, only one death so far, That's which is very, very good. Um, a lot of you probably don't realize that I lead trips around the world for the Smithsonian and then for Stanford University for the Alumni Association. I've been working for Stanford for 35 years. And it's fun to go to places I know a little bit about, and we talk about the geology and the plants, the animals and the history and things like this. And this past year, I got a chance to uh, lead a Smithsonian trip down to Antarctica. And uh, the geology department of Portland State has been working uh, in Antarctica for many, many years. Uh, and so you're gonna see a couple uh, photos uh, from Antarctica given to me by Andrew Fountain, in addition to a lot of my uh, ones from down there. Also, early in my career, I was a glacial guy, and you'll get a chance to see me in 1973 uh, as I uh, left Portland to spend seven weeks up on the Juneau ice field, living on the ice for seven weeks. Uh, and, uh, and, and I don't do as much in the glacial stuff anymore as I did then, but it, when I got down to Antarctica, I got a chance to do that. Uh, also, uh, the week after I was down there, Leslie Brunker for our cl club, she also was on one of the sister chips uh, that I was on. So uh, let's um, take off and talk a little bit about it. Here's a map of the world. I've got my little old pointer. You fly down to the very, very southern tip of Argentina. You come across to the Antarctic Peninsula, and that's where the whole thing takes off. Let's see if I can, huh, I need, oh, there we go, okay. Um, and so here is a map of Antarctica. Everything is basically to the north, but this is, we uh, dividing this thing up, the East Antarctic ice sheet is very, very large. West Antarctic ice sheet, very important. Trans-Antarctic mountains going through it, and then the Antarctic Peninsula. The Drake Passage is the most difficult passage in the world for ships to go through, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, you fly down into Ushuaia, 
uh, which is right at the tip of Patagonia. You go across Drake Passage, takes two and a half to three days. Then you go up and down. All of the tourists go up and down this uh, uh, Antarctic Peninsula and then back over. Yeah, we were very lucky because we did not have a lot of up and down, but other people sometimes do, and sometimes it's, it's impassable. Uh, also, the three red dots are the three American bases, the Ross base, which I'll come back to, the one at the South Pole, and then the Palmer Station up in the peninsula. Just to give you an idea uh, as to the uh, size of Antarctica compared to the United States, uh, we fit into that. And then also the other major place in the world where we have got, uh, um, okay, let's see, there we go, uh, where we have uh, continental glaciers is Greenland showing you how big Greenland is related to the United States. So what I'm going to start out with a few facts about uh, there. I'm going to definitely talk a little bit about geology. I'm going to talk about economic development. And tourism is one of those, and then the effect on the environment. Uh, if you do research there, how do you do that? I'm going to talk a little bit about glaciers, the ice sheets, the ice shelves. All comes back to climate change, and the last couple of slides are going to relate to McMurdo uh, and the American base that is down there. I mentioned that Drake Passage, where every, very difficult to cross across. Uh, the flow is 600 times the flow of the Amazon River. It's about 500 miles wide, named after Sir Francis Drake. And uh, in, in most boats, it's up and down and up and down. It's horrendous. Uh, it takes generally two and a half, three days for tourist ships to go across. A guy from Portland, Colin O'Brady, and five others just this past Christmas decided to row across it. And they did it in 13 days and set the world's record for the first time. This is where there is their boat. There were six of the guys on it. Three would sleep while three were rowing and they would go alternate back and forth and back and forth. I'm gonna come back to Colin because he also skied across the country, uh, the uh, continent. But Antarctica, 98% of the land is ice covered. Only, uh, and then 2%, it happens to be water and then dry, the dry valleys. 98% is covered by the ice sheet. So it's the world's largest continental glacier. Highest point, big, 16,000 feet in elevation. Lowest point is actually 800 feet below uh, sea level. And there is a large lake, but it's underneath the ice. It's under uh, uh, Vostok, which is one of the Russian stations. And it is 4,800 square miles in size. It is incredible. This is the seventh continent of the, the world, the last frontier. I'm going to come back to the, the one because there is a new continent that I will talk about. So the parts of Antarctica that you've got, you've got the ice sheets, uh, and this is the ice that is on top of the bedrock. Uh, and uh, the thickest part is 15,000 feet thick. Then you, where the ice goes out into the ocean, that is called an ice shell. The Antarctic Peninsula, this is where tourists go, and I'll and spend a little bit of time talking about it. And then that 2% uh, ice-free area, the dry areas, uh, dry valleys, I'm gonna take you to two. In the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, lots of volcanoes in there and very complex geology that we have in that area. So here is a, um, a, a picture of the uh, Antarctica. The East Antarctic ice sheet dominates here. And then the West Antarctic ice sheet here, there is the peninsula up here. And then here's the Ross ice shelf, which is the biggest. And then the second biggest here and then the Larsen ones up here. East Antarctica, very old rocks. It's like a this Canadian shield, anywhere from seven, 650 million years old to 3 billion years old. Mostly metamorphic rocks, nice as schist, and then some granites that are involved. We take the ice away down there. Uh, you can see in the background, you have got the East Antarctic ice sheet, the Trans-Antarctic mountains that go all the way up into the peninsula, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and here's the Ross ice sheet shelf, which is down here, I'll come back later on. Uh, if we took the ice away and we didn't have isostatic rebound, everything moving up, this is the only parts that would be above sea level. But if you take the ice away, all of it would be above sea level. Uh, down there, there are only two days a year. There is winter and summer. Right now, it is dark. Uh, from March until September, there is no sun in the sky, and it is dark. And then the winter, and then the our winter, their summer, uh, it is uh, the sun is in the sky. 
Here is a map and it shows all of the major bases that are found down there. Uh, and down here at the end of the Ross Ice Sheet, you've got the New Zealand base and also the uh, American base. McMurdo uh, Amundsen base is at the South Pole, which is right in the middle. And then you have the Palmer base that is up here. Many other countries uh, have bases down there, all have claims on the, the country uh, there. The Antarctic Peninsula, uh, where most of the tourists go, has many different names because different countries have different uh, names for it and claims there. Chileans call it O'Higgins Land. Uh, the Argentinians called Tierra del San Martin, and then we call it the Palmer Peninsula. And it's basically a bunch of bedrock islands uh, all tied together with ice uh, that you go there and research stations from many different countries. Lots of fjords, coastal mountains, it resembles the Andes. Uh, and here is a picture of what most of the tourists see, and it is absolutely beautiful. The five days that we were over there, it was sunny three of the five, which is totally uh, unbelievable and uh, unbelievable pictures. I wanted to mention the eighth continent. Geologists have, uh, have been traveling around the world, drilling to the bottom of the ocean. And what do you always find? Basalt, basalt, basalt. Uh, granite is a rock that is only found on land. Uh, and uh, off of the, the whole area around New Zealand, you have got all granite underneath the Chatham Rise, the Cl Campbell Plateau, the Challenger Plateau. And we believe that that is the eighth continent of the world. Uh, and that is, most of it is sunk only with New Zealand sticking up above that. So if you want to visit all eight continents, make sure you hit New Zealand in addition to Antarctica. I also wanted to mention a local Portlander, Colin O'Brady. Uh, he uh, completely skied across the country. He went to Lincoln High School, grew up here. I think he then went on to Yale. Uh, and he skied 932 miles across, no support, except he was skiing and pulling a sled by himself. Uh, the last day in his trip, he did 77 miles because he was racing a guy from England, a guy named Louis Rudel. Uh, he won uh, in this whole thing. He's only 34 years old. Rudel is 49, so it was a little more difficult him. But during this trip, the average temperature was thir negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit with a wind chill of 60. Here is a picture of his sled that he slid across Antarctica. Incredible feat, and it was a Portlander that uh, did that. So economic development that we have down there, uh, and again, there's a treaty that uh, you can do things in the ocean, but not on land. Uh, seal industry in the early 1800s, many ships down there, they basically almost wiped out the two populations. The good news is many of us come back. Then the whalers came in in the 1800s. Uh, they still are having an effect today. Uh, 1931, they had 40,000 uh, whales. Now there's down to 6,000, 6, but they're coming back. But it's interesting now, starting in the 70s, Japan, Soviet Union, and Norway have been down there, major fishing vessels cod, herring, and whiting are the main ones. And now they are going for krill. Krill is being the new health food um, uh, thing. And it's gonna have an effect, and I'll come back to that. Tourists started coming in the 1950s, small ships, mainly going to the peninsula. Uh, and then they started flying in 1970, until 1979, Air New Zealand had 747s that would go over and see Mount Erebus. And then they had a major crash and they stopped. Uh, and so, uh, just to show you how many tourists go there, uh, 2019, there were 30 ships, about 35,000 uh, visitors. 2020, uh, this last season, 40 ships, 50,000 visitors, and they have planned for this next year, the season, uh, to have primarily 60 ships and 70,000 visitors. This is the new frontier for visitors around the world. Now, the problems you're going to have with all these ships, you're going to have air pollution, ship waste, but they are trying to reduce all of that. Um, all of the tourist uh, companies that bring people down there, they make sure that when you get on the boat, they clean all your clothing, and so you don't take any bugs or anything on shore. Uh, you, you clean the boat boots when you get on and off. You only have one ship per site. You get into Zodiacs, you take them in, you come back on. Uh, you, when you get on land, they don't want you touching an awful lot. Uh, uh, and the maximum people in every ship is 200. So it is not being overrun. And each ship will generally have uh, five to 10 sh ships a summer. 
The food web down there is incredible. Krill is at the head of it. These are little shrimp-like uh, organisms. They are the food for whales, for all of the penguins, uh, for fish, many of the seals, etc. And now what we are doing is uh, harvesting it for humans too. Uh, and taking away from the food populations. And then the actual populations are going down because the seas are warming up. Uh, the good news is, from down there is that the harvest of whales, seals, and penguins is way down. Uh, and so those populations are doing better. But the penguins are running into a big problem because when they are born, they are all born on land. And they have these cute little fluffy feathers. We saw many, many of the penguins while we were there. Uh, but for two months, they have these fluffy feathers uh, and the, the parents come in, feed them. Uh, they go out, do the fishing, come back in. And then they grow their normal uh, um, feathers afterwards. The problem is with the climate warming, and they are definitely seeing this, they're getting rain. And, and with the rain, it does not do well with the fluffy feathers. And you're seeing a reduction. A lot of baby penguins dying during this period of time because of the climate warming and the uh, uh, fluffy feathers. If you want to do research in the United, from the United States, uh, you fly from Los Angeles down to Auckland, and then from Auckland you go to Christchurch, and I used to live there, Glenda and I used to live there. We would see a lot of our friends as they would pass through, and then you go over to McMurdo. Uh, the, the accommodations on the planes aren't the best in the world, as you can see here, uh, and then when you arrive there in McMurdo, um, it's on the Ross ice sheet, flat as a pancake, uh, and then you get off, everybody's wearing, if you're American, you're wearing the red, and Ivan the terror bus comes and picks you up and then takes you into McMurdo where you stay until you get involved in your uh, research. Here's a picture of McMurdo, of the American base, and you can see in back of it is a volcano, that is Erebus, it last erupted in November of uh, 2019. Um, and then the American bases that we have, McMurdo has about a thousand people living there in the summer, a hundred in the winter. Now it's in the winter time. Palmer Station, 35 in the summer, 20 in the winter, and the South Pole has 35 in the summer, 20 in the winter. Russians have 12 bases, a lot of people there. The normal season is Halloween to February 1st. The U.S. government just came out and said, okay, we are not going to have a summer research season because this is a continent that COVID virus has not made it to since that time. Here's a picture of a young geologist, i.e. me, 1973 in my youth as I was heading up to, to Alaska uh, to do research up in those areas. And that's where I learned all of my basic glacial stuff. I was teaching in Switzerland at that time for five years. Now, but the glaciers that we find in Antarctica are different from all the glaciers that we're used to in North America and South America and all around the world because they're it's so cold, they're frozen to the bed. So there is no erosion. There are no depositional and erosional landforms like moraines and cirques and arets. And there's no slipping on the bedrock. Uh, all the deformation is within the ice. Uh, and there's no water coming out of the uh, snout. The only way it loses mass is through sublimation of the ice into the atmosphere or calving. Uh, the I Antarctic ice sheet is incredible. It covers 98% of the continent, as I mentioned, up over 15 thousand feet thick at its largest part, but it averages seven to 8,000 feet. Uh, therefore, the continent has the highest average elevation of any continent on the face of the earth. 90% of the world's ice and 70% of the world's fresh water is found in Antarctica. Uh, and with all that weight on it, it's depressed two and a half kilometers below sea level. And as I mentioned, uh, subglacial lakes are there. So what we're going to do is take you right next to McMurdo to the dry valleys. This, the map in the upper left-hand corner um, is upside down. Remember, that here is the, uh, the uh, peninsula down in the lower right, and right outside of it. So here is McMurdo. There is Erebus here. You go into the dry valleys. This is an area where Portland State and Andrew Fountain, uh, my colleague, has been doing a lot of research uh, in, in this area. The glaciers here, you walk right up to the glacier, there's no melting, it's just subliming off or things are breaking off and then evaporating off. My favorite mountain in the valley is the Oreo Mountain. It's a it's sandstone and dolomite and it kind of looks like an Oreo that you've got. Here is a typical of the research areas at all of the bases. 
Uh, this is the main place. You don't live in there, uh, but you do all of the uh, work, research work. You, everything is solar down there. Uh, and then you can see everybody lives in tents. Now, the, the temperature there is between 30 and 40 degrees uh, in the summertime. So it is a wee bit cold. Uh, here are the outhouses that are there. And it's interesting because we don't want to affect the, uh, uh, the ecosystem there. And so all of the waste in the outhouses is burned and then they recycle all the urine. If you go out and do field work for two or three days, you got to take a little baggie with you and a pee bottle with you and then bring it back. In the dry valley, they have maybe 10 to 20 cloudy days a summer. So most of the time it is beautiful, only six inches of uh, of snow uh, winter time, but uh, it, there's very, very little melting that is going on there. Let's talk about the ice shelves. And so here, it, the biggest one is down in the bottom, Ross, and the, right next to McMurdo, and then the Ronnie Filcher one is up there, and then the Larson ones further on up. So as you get up the peninsula, you have the Larson A, the B, the C, the D. And what we, what's happening is all of these ice sheets are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Uh, and, and here is the Larson B, and up on the right-hand side you can see it broke up back in 2002, gigantic, about the size of Rhode Island. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is as the ice shelves are getting thinner, the bigger and bigger uh, large uh, breakoffs are occurring and icebergs are creating. Larson C is beginning to crack. Uh, and, and so as this goes out and melts in the ocean, uh, it affects the sea level. The Ross ice, which is the biggest ice shelf that you have got, uh, look at how thick it is. I'll uh, give you the data in a second. Off in the distance, you've got Mount Erebus over here and then Mount Terror over here. Uh, it's the largest ice sheet down, down there, about the size of France, about 200 meters thick. Uh, and the, the whole front, as I showed you, is anywhere from 50 to 160 uh, feet high. Uh, so, but 90% of that ice shelf is below the water surface. Why? Because ice has a uh, uh, density of uh, 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter, so 0.1% of it will stick up above. First name by Sir James Ross when he explored there back in 1841, and he named the two vo uh, volcanoes after his uh, boats that he was with, Mount Erebus and Mount Terror. Uh, and then uh, in, 2000 and uh, in 2000, the biggest iceberg ever broke off. They called it the B-15, the size of Belgium, uh, and incredible. Now what we're finding is, and geologists who are studying the, uh, the, the whole continent there, climate change, uh, originally we said there's not much, uh, the glaciers are not being affected because normally what we do is we look at the snout of the glacier, the end of the glaciers, and the end of the glaciers were not changing that much except where you were calving off. Uh, but then we started measuring the thickness of the ice and said, oh, it is really, really getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Now, the rate of climate change is a lot less in the Arc than in the Arctic, but it still is significant. Geologists have been studying climate change for a long time. And in the last 2.8 million years, the climate gets warm, cold, warm, cold. The last uh, major cooling started about 25,000 years ago, and then it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer since that period of time. But here, this is showing you pictures from the Dry Valley. 1911, look at the boulder on the right-hand side. Here's the end of the glacier there, and there's the same boulder, and here it is here. The people are saying, ah, the ends of the glaciers just aren't changing. But then they said, hey, let's start uh, measuring the thickness of the ice. And now we're saying, you major changes here. Uh, between 1992 and 2002, we were losing uh, 43 gigatons a year during that period of time. Now, in the, just the last five years, it's five times the amount that is being lost. Most of that is in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Bird Station, which is one of the stations that is there, the air temp, average air temperature since 58 to 2010 has gone up 2.4 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, and if we melt the whole Antarctic ice sheet, sea level around the world will uh, rise 200 feet. And so here is a map showing you where the major climate change happens to be. And it's mostly in the West Antarctic ice sheet up in the peninsula, only a wee bit uh, out in the East Antarctic ice sheet. 
And just to end with, I just want to bring us back to McMurdo. Uh, and, and again, to show you the ice sheet. And so we're going to zoom in right there. And so it's an island, but everything is uh, 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 frozen around it. Here is Mount Erebus on the left-hand side. Here is Mount Terre, two volcanoes. Uh, and then there is the McMurdo base and then the, Ross, or the Scott base, which is the New Zealand base that is over there. Uh, Ross Dependency, uh, you can buy stamps from there. You got these two volcanoes. Uh, and Mount Erebus is the southernmost active volcano on the face of the earth. 12,000 feet high. It's been active for the last 1.3 million years. Why? Because it's a plate boundary. I didn't get into the plate boundaries, but it's had 10 volcanic eruptions uh, in its life history. And McMurdo is 35 miles away, and then 2019, it had an eruption. Two, uh, 1979, Air New Zealand, the big 747, crashed into Erebus, killing 200 and, uh, uh, 57 uh, passengers, and so they don't do the uh, air trip anymore. There is Mount Erebus, uh, and then to show you Mount Erebus and uh, Mount Terror off in the distance, steam still coming out there. That is the last place I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to show you a picture. Andrew Fountain on the left-hand side who gave me a couple of these slides here. All of his students doing research down there. Uh, it is the last frontier for us, and if you are interested in touring and seeing different places on the earth, visit it. It's the seventh continent. And then go to New Zealand if you haven't been there. That's the eighth continent. Thank you very much for the chance to talk to you today. Yay! Yay. Thank you. I'm sure everybody's clapping, clapping along with me. Thank you so much, Scott. So folks, if anybody has any questions, and if you, let's see if we can get this to work. But we'll see, then I see Bill raising his hand. And how can I ignore Bill raising his hand? Um, <laughs> So I'll just click, use whichever way you like. Hit the participants button and hit the little hand raise or gesture wildly. And if you're on the screen I'm looking at and I'm clicking through, hopefully I'll see you. So just because I saw Bill, because his video is right by mine. Bill Diaz, do you have a question for Scott? Please I do. Th yourself. Thank you. And I think I'm unmuted. Um, Scott, yes. I, I noticed in the past week there was a 100 degree temperature recorded at the Arctic. Why is there such a difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic? Well, I mean, right now it's winter, winter time down there in Antarctica. So you aren't going to be seeing temperatures. When I was there, they set the highest temperature mark um, in uh, Antarctica. Uh, it was 75 degrees oh, okay. uh, on the, the peninsula. Uh -huh. uh, up in the Arctic, okay, uh, it was 101 degrees uh, out there in, in Kamchatka, in Siberia. Uh, and alarming a lot of people because it's very early uh, in the season for the temperatures to be that high. The, the, you don't get as uh, warm a temperatures in Antarctica uh, versus the uh, Arctic. Why? Because it is a huge continent by itself and much higher elevation. And as you go up in elevation, you're going to have uh, cooler temperatures where the, the, the area and the Arctic was a much lower elevation that you've got up there. But uh, what we're seeing, uh, Jim Baylog, a, a guy that was in grad school with me, did a, a, a a movie a couple of years ago about the melting of the glaciers in, in, uh, up in Greenland. And it's just melting very, 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 very rapidly up in that area. The Arctic, the permafrost is melting at a much greater rate. And we're alarmed about it. Bill, good question. Thank you. All right, does anybody else have any questions for Scott? I am scanning, I am scanning, I am not. Oh, Jack's oh, got Jack. one. Oh, there, yeah. Jack has one. Uh, Jack ahead. first and then Dick. Not hearing you, Jack. Right. You go. Got it. Okay. Scott, uh, two questions, if I may. The first question is, as we recognize the temperatures globally are continuing to increase, at what point in time with current projections would we expect to start to see actual erosion from water in Antarctica? And the second question is, have how much evolution or progress has been made in refining the plate tectonic models for Antarctica? All right, so great, great questions. Uh, the, the, the climatologists are working on the, the, uh, the models for the, the future uh, time period. 
uh, and uh, they, they, they always have two windows, you know, the, the, the two extremes. And, uh, and so someplace in between that is what you're gonna be happening. Uh, but uh, right now we're seeing that uh, the, the ice shelves are, are, these huge icebergs are opening and breaking up. And so they're having to change all of their models because 20 years ago, we did not think that things were gonna be happening. So everybody is pointing towards 2100, you know, the, the year at that point. And, uh, I, I, I don't have the exact data for to answer your question, so I can't do that. But all I know is that they're moving everything up. Um, the second question was plate tectonic models. Oh yeah, plate tectonic model. Uh, that that was the last part. I didn't show you the maps of all of the different plate boundaries that are there between Patagonia and the Transantarctic Mountains, etc. There are volcanoes everywhere. Right. There, uh, there are 30 active volcanoes in Antarctica, and they're all different plate boundaries. Right. Very, very complex. And, right. uh, but, and, and they've been refined in the last 20, 25 years. It, okay. it was amazing uh, right. to okay. see the differences compared to other ones. Now, Dick had a, a question. Yeah. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Scott, uh, the one thing that uh, I know I shouldn't take away, but I have, is you said that when you're there, they recycle the urine. Now, explain exactly where that recycled urine goes and how it gets used. Uh, so, a, a good question there, and I don't know the answer to that. I, all I know is that they have to take it back to McMurdo, there, uh, and then uh, there is one icebreaker that comes in once a year, and the icebreaker breaks across the ice sheet, uh, and then it, it uh, dumps all of the gasoline and the wood and everything for the next year and then takes away all of the garbage and the urine. And I don't know. Well, they take it to obviously New Zealand and they maybe just put it into a sewage treatment plant. I should well, ask my good. friend Andrew. I don't know what the answer is. Well, that, that's good. I was wondering if they recycled it, meaning that it became the drinking water. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. All right, I think we've got two more uh, in the queue right now for questions, which I think is gonna take us to the end of our meeting. So uh, Chris Ackerman and then Abby Collins. So go ahead, Chris. I don't know where you are on the screen. Oh yeah, I gotta hit your unmute. Oh, still muted. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I will jump over to Abby. Are you unmuted? And then we can come back to you, Chris. So greetings from Switzerland. I figured it would be appropriate uh, to be sitting in on, on Scott's presentation since he used to live here. Um, but my question is, what is something that completely took you by surprise that you weren't expecting or suspecting in this visit? Um, surprise, the beauty, the natural beauty of that uh, continent. Many times we would be on the deck of the boat and just you start crying. It is so gorgeous, so pristine. Uh, and a whale one time just came up right next to our boat and you could actually see the barnacles on it. And it was, um, it is, uh, I, I, it, so many countries around the world are working together to try and keep it as pristine as possible. And I think that that was uh, one of the things that's amazing. And uh, very, very little air pollution that, uh, that you have down there, so and they're working on it. Good question. And Chris, do you have a question? I do. Okay. Uh, so you talked about the fact that they're starting to fish for krill. Um, is there any possibility over time that, that, you know, because of course that's the basis of the food chain, uh, that we could start to impact that food chain? It's already, it is already started. And one of the re research biologists on our, uh, our boat uh, is a penguin specialist. And he said that they're already beginning to see uh, more penguins dying as a, as a re in the areas where these, these big, huge harvesting uh, ships just coming up and just, um, just taking all of the, the quill on and then drying them up and then uh, creating meal that they uh, sell to health food stores. And uh, they, a, lot of, a lot of the biologists who study down there are very, very concerned because it's the center of the, uh, the food chain. So yes, and, and they're already seeing it. At Falkland Islands, just north of there, is an area 
that has already been, the populations have been affected. So great questions. So thank you very much for the chance to talk to you. Whenever we get back together, if anybody has any other questions, be sure to do that. I'm going to turn it back to Kate. Thank you so much, Scott, so for being able to do this and willing to do this with all your fellow Rotarians live and on camera. Yes. See, there's that little button there. You can push hands and it's kind of like a clapping and a waving. And so thank you so much, Scott, for joining us today and doing this. And I'm just going to wrap up this meeting as we normally would. Thank you to everybody that was able to speak today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I think this is a pretty darn good turnout for our first live online meeting. And hopefully we'll keep building it up and building it up. As you know, next week, or you may not remember, next week is our changing of the guard. It is my last meeting as your president of this club. And um, I will be passing the baton, the torch, whatever you want to call it, on to our incoming president, Ruth Shelley. So um, please do join us because we have some fun up our sleeves that um, in recognition of a lot of people who have participated and um, supported and done service work this year, your fellow Rotarian. So please do join us online for that. And, um, and also get to hear Ruth as she uh, kind of lays out her vision for the next year. And I'm sure she's, she had a whole bunch of stuff thrown at her at the last minute, you know, this pandemic and unknown thing. So I have confidence she has a great plan in front. Um, I want to thank you again to all the speakers from today. I'd like to thank our guests. So good to see you, Abby. Abby Collins, for those that um, uh, don't know Abby, she was a member of our club, but she's in Switzerland now. So uh, she couldn't really make the Tuesday meetings usually, but maybe you can now. That's great. Good to see you also, Dick Thomas, as a former president of our club, but also not living in Portland. Well, not most of the year, I believe. And thank you for all the family members I saw joining in and sitting down to listen to Scott. That was excellent. And uh, please do that next time as well. Bring on anybody that's in your, that's isolating with you, bring them on to the meeting, have them see what Rotary is all about. Quick reminder, Thursdays at four, we're still doing the online socials for um, for the time being, we'll see how long AJ is willing to run that. Um, you get to hear from some current industry insight from a different Rotarian each week. Uh, Rotarian Angel Palato has been orchestrating the recipe gathering. So if you haven't been able to participate in that yet, send her a recipe with a beautiful photo. And we're distri distributing that um, around to everybody to, because um, I think we've all become chefs. It's kind of crazy. We're all a chef now. Uh, and then as always, go to the YouTube page and you can search the Rotary Club of Portland and see past videos and see updates on um, different service committees, all the good stuff. As always, everybody take care of you, take care of yours, reach out to a Rotarian this week, check in with each other. Let's continue our service work because that is still going on. There are committees still meeting, so continue our service work so that when we say that we are committed to service above self, it is more than a motto, it is a Rotarian value to uphold. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>